All right, here we go. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 9. Does that look okay? All right, let's read. We're just going to go ahead and read. I'm going to try not to scroll too fast. Uh, so let's read the word of the Lord. Amen. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And in the shapes and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt. Did I, did I lose my train of thought? Am I, am I going in the right direction? Seems like I'm saying the same thing over. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels which were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I calculated that and it comes out to 200 million. And I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray, Lord God, that you'd give us understanding and revelation. Pray, oh Lord God, that you'd help us, Lord, to, to do, do right by your word, oh Lord God, that you'd give us understanding and revelation. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know about you, but throughout my Christian walk, early on in my Christian walk, there were when I I can say that there's that at this point in my life. I'm much more excited about the whole of God's Word than I ever really have been. And for quite some time, by His grace, I've been very excited about the Word of God. But, but early on, you know, there were parts of Scripture it seems like I would get excited about, and then maybe other parts that I wasn't ex as excited about. 
And, and sometimes when it comes to this, well, in the book of Revelation, sometimes people aren't really that excited. And if I could tell a little story, I don't think you'll mind. There was a time in my brother Aaron's life that, and I am not don't say that to be whatever, because I'm telling y'all who know him that, and you know how much he loves the book of Revelation, right? Because he got up here and he did a great job teaching on it. But I can tell you there was a time when he, and I was like, dude, what about, what about this? And he may not remember all the conversations. He's like, man, I try to get into it and I just can't. And look, that brother had been straight up like so excited about the book. So what I'm, but what I'm trying to say is, is that it's the whole of God's word. See, sometimes people get excited about parts of it. And then even with this particular information here, we might could say, because I've heard people say it before, but we're not even going to be here anymore. They used to say that about the seals, too. Yeah. And I was like, well, hold on now. So now I'm saying, hold on now. But even with this, they're like, this is the wrath of God. We're not even going to be here anymore. Okay, good news. If you're a believer and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, you won't be here at this point. Praise God. Jesus. But what about all the other people? Whoa. Whoa. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. See, when the word of the Lord enters into your heart, when wisdom enters into your heart and it starts to have its way on the inside of your life, something amazing happens to your heart, to your mind, to the way you begin to think. What is that amazing thing, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Can I tell you? It becomes a lot less focused on yourself. Mm. You start to be concerned about others. You start to be concerned about the souls yeah. of yeah. other people. Amen. And, and, and where they may be in their understanding of God. And you start to allow God to have his way. And so with you and through you. Amen. And so I can't preach loud enough and passionate enough and turn my face red enough to convince you of that. Right. That's got to be a work of the Lord. We were just praying in there earlier before and just said I was even praying because sometimes I'm so grateful that God, when we talk about the cross, that he's even given me an understanding of that. Of what that, that love for God commendeth or showed his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And that sounds important and it sounds real. But until the love of God really does reach in and reveal what Calvary was really all about. And start to free you up in your life. You understand what I'm saying? You want to tell, let me tell you about my Jesus. I love that song. I probably can keep talking about it all night. Let me tell you about my Jesus and how he can change your life. But you can sing the song. I can yeah. sing the song. But until he really changes our life, yeah. it's going to be hard to tell somebody about our Jesus. That's it. Yeah. So what's my prayer? My prayer for you tonight, my prayer for me tonight, is that the Lord would really change us. Yes, Lord. Not a whole lot of change left that needs to be done in Amen. me. Amen. Amen. Change us, Lord. Change my heart. That I would see things the way you see things. Yes. Amen. Well, so look, last week we covered, I think, three of the trumpets. So we're just a real quick review we covered this is trumpet number one. First angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. So trumpet number one, you remember we went through the seals, seal number seven opened <coughs> trumpet number one, trumpet number one blows. So now this is, we're, we're right in, we're in the wrath of God now, okay? And so God's wrath is being poured. This is not man's wrath. This is not the Antichrist's wrath. This is not Satan's wrath. Satan's got some wrath for folk. This is God's wrath. This is God's wrath being poured out on the ungodly. And guess what? There's people that are still going to be on this earth experiencing this. That this wrath wasn't so, say, prepared exactly for them. But they're going to be what you call collateral damage. Because they had not receive the Lord. I believe that there's going to be, and this is my opinion, I believe that people will be saved during this time frame. I believe it, it, it may look a whole lot different than what we got time to get into tonight, but I believe that people's lives will be saved, that, they, that not everybody that's on the earth after the rapture is going to be consigned to the devil's hell, but, I, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be a mess of a time. Amen. And, and I don't know about you, but but I don't want any anybody to have to go through these things. But one of the things that we talked about is, you know, hail, fire mingled with blood and that they were cast on a third part of the of the trees was burned up and all the green grass was burned up. And the one little thing that I mentioned and you might not remember, but it was interesting to me that this was the first thing that God created during creation that had seed within itself to remultiply. 
No, and that's the, if you go back and you read Genesis and you read creation, God kept pointing out in creation the seed within itself, basically so that it could reproduce. And he doesn't really say that about man, and, but I can tell you that when God created, it's very obvious that the way he created, he created in such a way to make an earth that provided a habitable place for you and I. That's what he created earth for. The earth, the earth, the tree huggers and whoever they may be may not see light the same way that I do. But I can tell you that God didn't create the earth for the trees. God created the trees for you and I, whether it's for oxygen or fruit to eat or whatever. He, he, he created this earth because he wanted to create you and I. You are the darling. You are the darling of his eye. You're the apple of his eye. How do I know that? Because he bankrupted heaven and gave us Jesus to die on a cross. To die for your sin and for my sin. That's how much God the Father loved us. Okay. And, and so, but it's interesting to me. And so listen, I didn't mean to get into all this. But look, there's seed in you and I. Because God wanted mankind to reproduce on the earth. Why? Because ultimately, God wanted an eternal family. Amen. And so I just thought that that was an interesting thing to me of talking about, you know, creation. Then the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. I don't want to get into this too much, but, but because, you know, there's a lot of things that I think about whenever I read the word of God. And, and, and a lot of things, especially in this, a lot of this is very symbolic. I used to find myself the kind of preacher that said, this is what it is. And you wouldn't leave any room for thought. But I'm going to be honest with you. The more I know about the Bible, the more I learn about the Bible, the less I feel like saying and preaching, this is what it is. Especially whenever there, there's times that nobody can prove what something is. And, and, and I'm just letting you know, I try to work hard, but it doesn't mean, you know, that I still couldn't work harder. But my point is, is that I'm not trying to slouch and slack. And, I, and as much work as I put into it, I'm still not convinced that I figured it out. So I tried to leave it open. And listen, I was telling Aaron before church, the more I've been willing to do that, the more free I am to let you know. As hard as I work to try to get the answers for you, I realize that if I, I try to be careful because I wouldn't want to come across the wrong way. Because then I feel like I'm sounding like, like I'm trying to put myself, up, and that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say, I know how hard I'm working and I know what I do understand about the Bible. And there's a lot of preachers. And I'm not saying they don't know more about the Bible. But they preach certain things as though this is the way that it is. And I know good and well that there's no way that they can say it with such fervency. Because there's no way that they can prove it. I hope that that makes sense to you. And so we're, we're left to, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So look. I think that when it says this is a mountain, that there's a good chance that this could be some type of a heavenly or celestial body like a meteor or a meteorite or something that ends up striking the earth. But I have no way to prove that. And look, there was a time whenever I told you about Sister Toot was having a Bible study when I first got saved. And she would often talk about the fact that John was seeing things. And I think it's important for us to understand this because this is a possibility. John the Revelator was seeing things as the Lord was giving him a vision. And he's trying to describe them how the best way that he knows how. And so if this is something modern, this may not be a meteor from heaven. Could it be like some type of a missile? I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there because John doesn't know what a missile looks like, but it looked like a burning mountain. I do know this. It crashes into the sea. It causes the sea to become as blood. Do you remember those pictures I showed you from the BP oil spill? Okay. So could it be, it could literally be a huge mountain or like a meteor. And then guess what happens? Because it, it destroys a third part of the ships. You see that? That's towards the bottom of the verse. It destroys a third part of the ships. It destroys a third part of the creatures that are in the sea. It turns the sea into blood. I have no reason to believe that it couldn't be literal blood. I'm okay with that. God can do whatever he wants to do. I'm just trying to look at it from every different angle that I can. And to try to bring it to you. I don't know exactly what this is. But I know it's causing a lot of catastrophe. It's something that looks... It says, as it were a great mountain. It doesn't say that it was a great mountain. The book of Revelation is full of this, as it were. They had on their heads, as it were, gold crowns. It doesn't mean they had gold crowns on their head. As it were, it looked 
like a gold crown on their head. It looked like a mountain that was flaming with fire that fell into the sea. I know this. If a big old comet or meteor fell into the sea, it probably caused some kind of a tidal wave. A bit, if it was, a, you know, something else like a missile, it probably caused a lot of, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's causing destruction is the main point. Now, I do want to make a connection to the Egyptian plagues, you know, because whenever the Lord sent Moses, he touched the rod in the rivers and in, in the waters and it turned the waters to blood. Okay, and so I definitely want you to know that I believe that there's a connection behind that. And I want to say this, that there's no question in my heart and in my mind, the more I'm understanding the Bible, that all these things are coming back together. And this is not accidental. The fact that blood is going to be in the waters at the end of time. And the fact that when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, that happened then. There is an interconnection between the two. God was bringing plagues out on Egypt, which is a type of the world. He's going to bring a plague of blood upon the waters, which is, which is going to be the world. And that God at this point in time is declaring war on the ungodly and that he is taking back the earth that belongs to him. He created it. And if he, and, and when he's going to bring destruction upon it, because you know what? They didn't handle it the way they were supposed to handle it. Who's they? Human beings. L listen, I'm only on slide two, but let me just say this. Whenever God created Adam, he tr entrusted the domain with him. He said, tend and keep the garden. He, he said, name the animals. And what did Adam do? Adam fell, fell to the serpent. And in a way, I, I preached this last week, allowed the enemy to receive power on the earth because God had given power to Adam to be a good steward. And Adam, through the fall, relinquished that power to the serpent. And we talked about that last week. And that's why we have chaos on the earth. The world is not going to see it the way that, that you would see it if you learned the word of God. But I'm here to tell you that that's why there's catastrophe. That's why there's chaos. That's why there's bad stuff going on in our own lives. Because of the fall. Good news is this, is that God wants to restore humanity. Amen. God wants to restore humanity and he does it one soul at a time. Now, in the past, he did it different. He, he, he created a nation out of Abraham, but his plan was always to give us Jesus. I'm trying to tell you that God's taking this place back one step at a time. One step at a time, and now he's taking it back. One soul at a time, amen? And he's changing people's hearts, and he's changing people's lives. And one of the things I said last week, ye, I, well, I didn't say it like this, but I won't say ye, the enter your eye, my friend. This, this is not low, no little sitting on the fence kind of thing. No, you were in the world. If you've been saved, then you got saved out of the world. And there may be a whole lot of churches out there that are going to say it different, and I'm not trying to judge them. Let them do their thing, but I ain't doing it that way. Because God called his people to be separate. I'm not trying to get graphic, but why do you think he caused the children of Israel to circumcise themselves? I mean, that's pretty gruesome if you think about it. Cut the foreskin off. Cut the filthy flesh off through the shedding of blood. God wants to destroy our filthy flesh through the shedding of blood that was already shed. That's another type of cross right there. Separate yourself from filthy flesh. And guess what? It's a sign of the covenant that you have with me. I, you know, on the way up here, I feel like the Lord already gave me my message for the next time I preach. And it's going to be heart surgery. Because in the New Testament, it's talking about a circumcision of the heart. See, God's all about bringing it all back around. Amen. And I'm just telling you, he's redeeming mankind. One at a time, my friend. One at a time. One at a time. But he wants his people to be separate. He wants us to look different. You can't have it both ways. Amen. You can't have it both ways, Christian. Right, right. You're either in or you're out. Okay? And, and, and you're in because he said it. I didn't say it. He said it. Because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And we've all tried to do it before. Right? Have we not? Every last one of us in this room. Yes. Yes. Except for maybe Jordan. Every last one of us in this room have tried to do it both ways. One foot in and one foot still in the yes, world. Sir. All right? Okay. Let me move on. That's just slide number two. All right, here we go. The next one was trumpet number three. And I don't know if this is what you were talking about, Aaron, whenever you talked about the star falling from heaven. So it could have been a possibility of an angel. I can't remember if this is what you were talking about. But we're going to get into in chapter nine, 
where it's going to talk about another star. And that specifically is obvious it's an angel. It's a good point, though, because i got to tell you that stars are sometimes referred to as, as angels are referred to as stars in the Old Testament. And so, but at the same time, this seems like another heavenly body. It seems like it to me, but I, I, don't, I don't know everything, so I could be wrong. But look, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. Sounds like another meteor of some type. And it fell upon the third parts of the rivers, upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. You remember that? Now, if it's a star, it's probably, it, it seems like it'd be a fallen star. I, I mean, if it's an angel, it seems like it'd be a fallen angel. And it's interesting because somebody brought up to me about C.S. Lewis, and I have the book in my house about, I think it's called the Screw Tape Letters, and I think one of the demons' name might be Wormwood. I can't remember, but I think. But what I did was I showed you a picture of Chernobyl. You remember that? Chernobyl, Russia. Because the word Chernobyl in Russian literally means wormwood. I don't want to go back there. I told y'all about all that occultic, global occultic stuff and all the weird stuff going on on the earth. But I want you to know, I will say this. I want you to know there's a lot of weird stuff going on on the earth. You know, and it has been for a long time. Reality is, we're just now kind of waking up to it. Some of us more recent than others, but I got to tell you, some of you because, you because you've been listening to some of what I've been teaching, but some of you because you learn from other sources, praise God that he's opening our eyes though. But I just need you to know, okay. there's been a whole lot of weird stuff going on on this earth for a really long time. Okay. Even before the flood, some really, really, really weird stuff going on before the flood. All right. Okay. So let's just keep going. So here, that was, that was trumpet number three. Now this was trumpet number four. I really should have covered this last week because it was in revelation eight, but I did not cover it. And the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten. That means to be, you know, snuffed out. And the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise, so the day and the night. So I don't know if there's electricity right now, but I'm kind of doubting it. I mean, we got, the waters are turning into blood. So I'm really pretty sure that you probably don't have electricity at this point. I'm just trying to say it's going to be really, really dark, okay? And all kind of bad stuff happens when it's really, really dark. Right. And so that, so we see that now I do want to just make a quick that's that's really the majority of what I want to say about that. Uh, there may be more to be said, but look, but I do want to say again that God created this earth and just as he <coughs> gave it light, he can also take light away. And he and the whole reason he's doing all this again, I want you to know is he's pouring out wrath on the ungodly. Look, Genesis 1 and 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Light, you know what? That must have been a beautiful thing, because this earth was filled with darkness before. And what a beautiful thing, amen, when the sun rises in the morning, praise God, and you know that there's another beautiful day, amen, praise God. All right, so... <laughs> And it says, and I beheld, and this is Revelation 8, 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. So we went through four trumpets, and then there's three more. We're going to about to break, we just read about those in chapter 9, and we're about to break that down. But I just want to mention real quick the word woe, and it's three times, and when I look that word up, and you may have the app now, I see some of y'all back there, y'all got y'all's olive tree apps with the strongs in it, y'all are tapping and y'all learning the words, praise God for that. But the word woe means grief. It means great grief, you know? And, and there's gonna be great grief upon the world whenever all of this starts to happen. So here's Revelation 9, 1, and, and listen, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this, and I hope you don't get tired of me, but this is where my brain works, and I just want you to see, I don't, I'm not doing this so you see how hard I try, that's not what I'm doing. I, I just, this is how my brain works, and so, sometimes I wonder if it's a good thing, because it's like I'm paying such attention to such detail. But, but three of the things that, sh that stuck out to me in this verse, this one verse, were, <coughs> The star, the word star right there. Because look at it, it says, Revelation 9, 1. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key 
of the bottomless pit. So the first thing that I want to point out to you is the word star right there. The second thing I want to point out to you is the word key. I want you to, I want, I want to point out the word key to you. And the third thing I want to point out to you is the word, the words bottomless pit. Now, when I look at this scripture even harder, after I've already put the slides together, I kind of wish I would have made room to put the word him, the personal pronoun him. And I think I wish I would have put the word given. Why? Because look, I've been reading a lot of commentaries for a long time. And I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of times I agree with what they're saying. And a lot of times I disagree with what they're saying. And I've been trying to stick to what I feel like the Lord shows me. But there's a lot of differing opinions on who is this him? What is this star that fell from heaven? What's the deal with this key and to be able to open up this bottomless pit? And so there's a lot of different interpretations of this. And so what I want you to know is the first thing we're going to start with is the word star right here. Now look at this. Job 38 and 7. Job 38 and 7, the word star. It says right here, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That comes out in the book of Job, one of the oldest written books of the Bible right there, the book of Job. You know when he's talking to Job and he said, you know, he tells Job, stand up. And it's kind of like you get the idea, stand up and put your pants on like a man. And I'm about to talk to you, Job. Okay. And, and this is one of the things that he wants to know. Were you there when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Because God's talking about when he created the angels of the earth. Now, we've already been through the book of Daniel, right? And we've already pointed out the word sons of God. And we've already been through Genesis and we talked about the Nephilim. You remember that? And the fallen angels that cohabited with the daughters of men and produced Nephilim or giants on the earth. And we talked about the fact that the words sons of God, Ben Elohim, sons of God, means it, the idea is angels. When we look at the context, there's no question. Sons of God means angels in these contexts. And so what I need you to know is that the word stars is interconnected to angels. All right. That's the first thing I want you to see. Now, let's, let's keep on. The star fell. All right. The, the, that's what it said. Right. The star, I saw a star fall from heaven. Now, what I want you to know is, is this, is that is this word. And I don't know if you can even see this. I'm going to try to magnify it. But this word fall right here. Look what it can mean. Can you, uh, you probably can't see it, so let me just read it to you. To fall down, to fail, to descend from a higher place to a lower. So that's a little, it could, that could be taken more than one way. In other words, to descend, like if you're on a ladder and you climb down, oh Lord, then you descend, right, from a higher place to a lower. Correct? Dude, he spam called me and just sent me things. What is that? All right. Here we go. All right. Y'all ready? Look, when you're on a ladder, I know I made the point, but you descend from a higher place to a lower, but look, it says to fall, to be thrust down, metaphorically to fall under judgment. I think that if we're all in agreement and we all took our time to study this, the conclusion, because you can't just read one sentence when you use the Strong's. You need to understand that. Okay. If that's a new tool that you're starting to use, you need to understand a little bit of how to use it. You can't, and, you, and it's not fair to the word of God to find the one that you want it to be and stop there. <laughs> that don't work, my friend. You got to look at the context of what's being said and look at the options, and then you got to try to go from there. So what I'm trying to say is, is that if I'm honest with you, the more evidence is that this is a fallen angel. Now, I'm willing to agree with you, if this is what you notice, that it could, that to descend from a higher place to a lower could also mean that... They were high and that they just descended, all right? But nevertheless, remember, the star fell, or if you want to say it, descended from heaven, and, and it was given a key. You remember that? It was given a key. All right, so, so that's, I want you to see that. So the key. Now, some people make the point, and this is the point that they make, Revelation 1.18, this is Jesus talking, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death so who has the keys of hell and of death jesus, jesus has the keys of hell and of death the, these keys don't belong to no fallen angel the, no, there's no fallen angel or even a good angel these these keys don't belong even to good angels these keys belong to jesus amen because why he died on the cross 
And he rose from the dead, hallelujah, and he ascended unto the Father, and he gained victory over death, hell, and the grave, and he gained victory over the forces of evil. I would like to make a point, though. I'm not going to, I didn't get in all this because it's something that I really like, though. I want you to know that all the words hell don't mean the same thing. Okay, I'm just going to, just real quick, I'm just mentioning this in passing. There's sometimes a word hell in the New Testament that's, from the Greek Tartarus, which is where the fallen angels are, okay? Which does not mean the hell. What do you think of when you think of hell? You think of fire? Okay. I want you to know that there's a concept of hell called Gehenna. It comes out from the Valley of Hinnom. This is the idea that was a real valley in Israel. And guess what? That's the lake of fire. That's not mentioned until Revelation chapter 20. That's not what this is talking about. There's a, there's a hell known as the abyss. Okay, or the pit, that's what we're talking about right now. In the Old Testament, the grave was considered hell. Sheol was considered hell. Hades was considered hell. But they didn't all mean the same thing. Basically, what it described was the place of departed souls. David said, I thank you that you don't suffer my soul to remain in, in hell. And he also talked about Sheol and Hades and the grave. Because guess what? When a soul is departed from its physical body, it goes somewhere else. Okay, we don't have time to break all that down right now, but in the, but now that soul goes to heaven if you're saved, amen. If you're not saved, then I go off the parable of Luke chapter 16. I believe it goes to a place called torment until it ends up in hell, which is going to be the final death, which is Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. All right. So some people make the point that Jesus has the keys. So why would a fallen angel have the keys? Well, I just want to bring something to you real quick. Look, the key was given. Did you know that? You might not have noticed. You might have already forgot what the verse said because I used so many words. But the key was given to the star that fell. Now, I want to give you another verse that we've already covered. Revelation 6, 2. Because I want to point you. See how I put that word the same color? Given. Just as the key was given in Revelation 6, 2, we were talking about the Antichrist. You remember that? What was given to him? A crown was given. So who gave him the crown? Jesus is the one that opened the seals. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the key belongs to Jesus, but he gives it to whom or what he wills. Amen? And there's a purpose. Why would he give a crown to the Antichrist? Because it's time, my friend, to open the first seal and to release the end of the last seven because this time had to come upon the human race for God to finish the plan. Amen? All right. So the key was given. Now, people have also said God would not use a fallen angel this way. Now, this may be getting a little deep, but I love this passage of Scripture. That's why I'm sharing it with you. And this is what I want to say. But he used a lying spirit to judge King Ahab. You might not have known that. Maybe you have. Maybe you forgot. So why wouldn't he use a fallen angel to judge the godless? All right. So look at this. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. And I'm going to turn to it in a second because I want to read it with you. All right, but, but, but whenever, before we do, I want to give you a little bit of context. All right, the context that I want to give you in this passage of scripture is that, is that this is what's going on. So, so the king, King Ahab is the king of Israel. All right, this is another little Sunday school class, right? Do you remember that this is after the split of the kingdom? Y'all remember how Solomon did not do right in the eyes of the Lord. And he married all them women. And God said, don't marry those women. Why? Because they're going to draw your heart away from me. New Testament revelation, Christian. If you love the Lord, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Amen. Period. God is, there ain't no negotiating this, my friend. God has been the same from the beginning until the end. And to his people, he said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. See, because when you... Why? Why did he tell them in the Old Testament? Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't marry those women. Why? Because they did not serve the God that Israel served. And if you marry them and you, or you hang out with them and you spend close time in fellowship with them, whether they're your best buds or whatever, it's, listen, I don't, do I have to break it down? The Lord does not teach isolation. He teaches separation. If you got to work with them, live for Jesus in front of them while you're working with them. If you got to go to school with them, you, you get the point, right? Amen. But you're not supposed to be fellowshipping with them. What does it mean to fellowship? It means 
If you go to Tampico's and you're hanging out with them long enough and they're drinking margaritas and the Lord done showed you that you ain't supposed to drink margaritas because when you drink margaritas, then you go smoke dope and you act like a fool and you're not acting like a Christian, then you ain't supposed to be smoke drinking margaritas. And if you keep hanging out with them long enough and you drink margaritas, yeah. guess what? You're going to be not acting like a Christian. That's why you're not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Amen. Okay, it just don't get no clearer than that. Right. And, that's, and that's the word of the Lord. That's not the word of Matt. Amen? Amen. And we wonder why we got all the chaos. Ain't like I ain't got none, but I want as little as possible. <laughs> it's bad enough out there. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's the story. So it's this, I went up on a rabbit trail. So the kingdom of God is split in two because Solomon didn't listen to the Lord and he married a bunch of women that served false gods. And they drew his heart away. And so after Solomon died, God split the kingdom in half. The top ten tribes were, were known as Israel. The bottom two with Levi, which were the priests, was mixed up in a little bit of the two different ones. Was Benjamin and Judah at the bottom. That was Judah. That's where Judah comes from. Okay. Um, and, and so Ahab at this time, King Ahab. Y'all remember how y'all done heard? Y'all done heard about Ahab. He was married to Jezebel. Y'all remember that? Y'all heard the name before. They were wicked, okay? And Ahab and Jezebel were over Israel. There was a king named Jehoshaphat that loved the Lord that was over Judah. It's a long story. It's a beautiful story. I love learning about it. But look, just make it fast. King Ahab called up Jehoshaphat and said, hey, I need some help. Because Syria has taken Ramoth Gilead. Y'all remember whenever Angie preached about the cities of refuge the other day? Okay, Ramoth Gilead was one of the cities of re refuge in Syria, a foreign country that did not belong to the Lord, had taken it as its own. Ahab said, you ain't supposed to have that. And he calls up uh, Jehoshaphat. He's like, Jehoshaphat's going to help me because he knows that don't belong to Syria, so he's going to help me. So Jehoshaphat comes up there. Yeah, you're right. That don't belong to them. That belongs to the Lord. I'll help you out in this deal. And so he says, but we need to hear from the prophets of the Lord. Okay, and so we're talking about we're talking about why that God used a lion spirit to deceive Ahab. So why would He not use a fallen angel to do what to, to open up this bottomless pit? Is the point I'm trying to make. All right, and so so whenever Ahab does it, so Ahab calls Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat says, "Can we call upon the prophets?" And and Ahab says, "Yeah, we got all kind of prophets." And so he calls the four hundred prophets of Baal. And they all sitting there telling Ahab everything he wants to hear. Oh, you're going to win. Go. Take your land. Do it. You know, and Jehoshaphat's over here scratching his head. Because you're not, you ever listen to a preacher. Hopefully you, you've come along enough where you listen to a preacher and like, dude, this is not even close to the word of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? A lot of people don't know the difference. Jehoshaphat's over there like, are you even serious? And he says, is there not another prophet that we can hear from? And you know what Ahab says? Yeah, there's this one. He's in prison. I got him locked up because his name is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. He know, I'd never tell me what I want to hear. He said, well, why don't you go get him and let's hear what he has to say. But because of, because before I put my army in this, I want to know, right? And so I, I told y'all about this story. And so they go get Micaiah of Imlah and he says, okay, tell us what you got to say. You know, he says, go on Ahab. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, the idea is go Ahab, you shall win. Go and conquer and take your land. And he's like kind of like mimicking and he's acting all like this. Because he's probably just trying to hurry up and just go back and just put me back in my prison stuff. Because you know that's what I'm doing. And Ahab, and Ahab says, come on, man. You know, tell the truth. Okay, you want to know the truth? All right, so let's read it. This is the truth. And he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven. Now I want you to get a picture of this. What is the host? A bunch of created beings that are supernatural, and we can imagine that they're probably angels because that's the easiest word. But we know that the beasts look different, but these are heavenly beings, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. So God's in the midst of all of this, okay? And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? So he talks to all this host of heaven. And he says, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, he had an idea, right? And another one said on that manner, he had an idea. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth 
and do so. Now, the point that I want you to know is, is that, yeah, is it weird? You better believe it. What does it mean? We need to dig it out. But, and and we're not, we don't have time right now because that's not our message. But what I want you to know is God used a lion's spirit right there. But, you know, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to get to that soon enough, I want you to know that the 2 Thessalonians 2 explains to us why God allows people to be deceived. He explains to us why he allowed the Antichrist to deceive people. You want to know why? Because people would rather believe a lie than the truth. In the end, God is going to give people what it is that they wanted. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that number. Amen? I don't want to be in that number. And so I want you to see that the Lord used a lying spirit in this situation. So if God's going to use a lying spirit, why would he not use, yes, ma'am? Did, did they end up going fighting? Yeah, they ended up, and in the end, what is all said and done, Ahab dies. So, you know, God, that was God's plan. And, you know, I want to say this. God didn't need the help of these hosts to make a decision. Right. Let us not be confused any more than he needs Naya or he needs Matt. Right. <laughs> or he needs Brendan or he needs Miss Angel. He, no, he allows us to partner with him. Yeah. Just as the created celestial beings, he allows them to partner with him. Amen? So it's not like he needed a good idea. He just knew that that particular idea would work. Amen. So he says, so I believe, so I'm saying, I believe that an angel, godly or not, I'll put in purple not because I believe it's actually a fallen angel, descended or fell, I believe he fell. And with the keys given to him, he opens up the pit, also known as the abyss. We'll get into that in a little bit. And he releases the contents of the abyss. I believe the contents released are two types of demon spirits, and we'll get into that in a moment. And the angel named Apollyon or Abaddon, I believe he was in the bottom of so this is, this is what I believe. Uh, now, I've got to be honest with you. In the past, I believed that this, this could have just been a good angel. And that the word fall there, and I'm going to tell you why. Because there's another scripture that talks about, about something similar in a second. And you can tell it's a good angel then. But, and I'm not even opposed that this could be a good angel. But I do know this. I don't believe personally that this is Abaddon or Apollyon. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Just hang with me. I'm going to break it down. I don't believe that he is the angel that fell. I don't believe this is Satan. Okay. I don't. I, I, it could be Satan with the key that unlocks the pit. And, but if he's got the key, then it's because Jesus gave him the key. And, I'm, and I, I made the point that God is not opposed to using lion spirits to bring judgment. So why? Because, see, they're all really and truly pawns in his hand. Does he not allow certain things to happen on the earth for a purpose and that he uses it? Yes, he does, right? Okay, so he releases the contents, and I believe that this angel, Apollyon, and I'll, you'll see why, or known as Abaddon, and really, I believe maybe multiple angels are released, all right? And so we'll look at some of those reasons why I believe that here in a moment. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the bottomless pit. Revelation 20, verse 1. Here's another example right here. Look. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Now, it is interesting how the wording is completely different, right? It doesn't say it fell from heaven. This one here says it came down from heaven. So I saw an angel come down from heaven, and he had the key of the bottomless pit. So here we talk about it again. And a great chain in his hand. All right, so I'm, I'm talking to you really about the bottomless pit right now, but I know it seems like I'm still talking about, the bottom, about the, what we just talked about. He says, and laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, I'm not talking about this right now, but listen, when you read the Bible and you come across something that seems a little bit weird and you have a moment in your brain, you need to stop and you need to try to ask some questions. Look right here, Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him, talking about the devil, the dragon, right, into the bottomless pit, shut him up and, and set a seal upon him that he should... Deceive the nations no more, this is the weird part, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. Why is that weird? Because that's something you need to think about. Why is God going to loose him after the thousand years? Okay? And there's a reason why, I believe. There's people that don't have glorified bodies that still have to receive Jesus Christ. And they're going to go through the millennial reign. And I, I wish I had time to break it down because it's an interesting concept. But, it's, but, but we don't. All right? So nevertheless, the enemy is going to be loosed for a short season after the thousand years of the millennial reign of Christ. But I do want to say this. 
as I said it last. Right now, the prince of the air, the prince of the air that is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. I've said this before, but the prevalent spirit in the air right now, this doesn't offend you, but this is reality, is the spirit of Antichrist. God's spirit is not moving on all the inhabitants of the earth. God's spirit, he's taken back land. He's taken back people sitting back there. He's taking back people sitting right here. He's taking back the preacher. He's taking back things that have been stolen from God. This world, whenever Adam fell, was taken from God. God allowed it to happen that way because he's got a bigger plan that we can't wrap our mind around. But I want you to know that that this, the prevalent spirit that rules and reigns on the earth and the majority, like the governments, do you think that they're listening to God? I mean, does God sometimes work on their hearts? Yes. Does God, is God still in control? Yes. Is God sovereign? Yes. Is God allowing all this to play out on the earth to, to allow his will to be performed? Yes. But the only, pe the only pieces of geography that are really being led by the Spirit of God are hopefully you and I. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, if we're honest with one another, you and I got to admit that sometimes we're not even allowing the Spirit of God to do in us what, what he wants to do. Amen? All right. Well, hopefully that makes sense. Some people are like, man, you give the devil too much credit. No, I ain't. I'm just, I'm trying to see it for what it is. Because see, after the, during this thousand years, this is the point I wanted to make. It's not the spirit of Antichrist that, that's prevalent in the air anymore. It's the spirit of the Christ. And I said that last week about Isaiah. There's going to be a time when the lion is going to eat straw like an ox. And the wolf and the lamb will lie together. And a child will put its hand on a serpent's hole. And he will not be harmed. Look, everything's going to fill the presence of the Lord. Everything's going to be filled with the love of the Lord. It's going to be a beautiful time, my friend. I wish I had time, more time to talk about it, but I don't. Let me keep moving. Look, I want you to see this, right? You see that word orange and deep, that word deep and orange at the bottom? And Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? He's talking about, he's talking to demons now. He's talking to this, this a demon-possessed man. And, and he said, legion, that's my name. Because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Remember, we're talking about the bottomless pit, right? And so this word right here for bottomless pit is, you see this word in the Greek, that's abusos, and it's the word abyss. And I just want you to know real quick, we don't have to spend a lot of time on that, the word abyss, bottomless pit, the word deep in that scripture, it's all the same thing. And this is not the final death in hell. The final death in hell is, again, Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. All right. Now, look at this. I don't know if you can see that too good. But this is basically, this is just a, one artist's rendition of what these locusts look like. It looks kind of crazy, right? But he just drew a picture, basically, of what the scripture said. Now, when you look at that, see, I don't know if you're like me. I try to be pragmatic. A lot of, like, what I mean is logical. Two, like, in other words, I want to use my intelligence, okay? I don't want to just read the Bible and not use my intelligence also, but I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Hope it does. All right. So what I, what I want you to understand is this, is that a lot of people say when you're interpreting the book of Revelation that you shouldn't, that is, that unless it's obviously not symbolic, that you should just take it logical, Okay. And, and take it for what it is. All right. Sometimes I agree with that, but sometimes I, okay. But is there any way you can wrap your mind around this logically? <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. Look at it. It's a locust, and it's got a face as it were a man, and it's got on his head as it were a golden crown. And it said he got a scorpion. He got a tail of a scorpion. And it says he stings everybody that doesn't have the seal on their head that the hundred and forty-four thousand have. On their head, and the, and when he stings them, it it, it it causes pain for five months to where they want to die, but they can't die. It says that man is gonna want it, or they can't die unless God lets them die, and they get stung by this thing, and they want to die. But God said, no, you're not even gonna die. You're gonna keep being tormented for five months. You're gonna be tormented by this thing. All right. Now, what I want you to know is, again, and we, we'll talk about it in a moment, but I want you to see this. The star 
was, was, had fallen from heaven and he had been given a key. And what he did was he opened up the bottomless pit. He opened up the deep. He opened up the abyss. And what happened? These locusts that looked like this, according to what the word of God says, ascended up like smoke out of the bottomless pit and like, like smoke. That's a lot of these things. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Robert used to say it a long time ago. He used to say, thank God that the hand of the Lord is on us and he protects us from what's in the spiritual realm. Now, you may not be a very spiritual thinking person, but I've come to be that way. I believe that we live in the midst of some people get fancy with it and they call it the fourth dimension. Meaning, you know, if an angel chose to manifest himself right now, he could. Right, because right. he has the ability to do that. I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's a spiritual realm that's going on. We can call it the second heaven. I think that that's a proper term to call it. But basically, I think it's all around. <laughs> so, right. There's things that are going on in the spiritual realm that you and I cannot see. And what Robert used to say is, thank God that the hand of the Lord is on us. Because if he pulled his hand back and he gave us just a little taste of what was going on in the spiritual realm, it says in the end, men's hearts will fail them. Now, I personally believe, while you may not be able to see it now, I believe that that's what, this is a demon spirit of some sort. Right, right. And this is, this is what this is. It comes up out the abyss. This is a demon spirit. Mm -hmm. And this thing is ugly, and it is mean, and, and I believe people are going to be able to see these things during this time. I think that the Lord's going to, and I can't prove it, but I believe people are going to be able to see it. And look, it's going to be dark, and you're going to be like trying, running for your life, and you're not going to be able to see it. Pop, you're going to get hit by one of these things, and you're going to be miserable for five, five months trying to die, and you can't even die. I don't know about you, but if you love it, see, you talk to some people, and they're like, well, how does this affect me, man? I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to get the rapture. Yeah, praise God, but what about all the people you've been working with? What about all the people you went to school with? These people are going to be getting popped by scorpions. My Lord. See what I'm trying to say? Yeah, it is a scorpion. My friend got a scorpion's tail. That's what that stinger is. Don't out preach me, sister. All right. All right. So look, so that's 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 one of them right there. All right. Now I went ahead and I put the other ones there because I said I think there's two kinds of demons that come out of this pit. Now some preachers don't agree because it doesn't say specifically they came out the pit, but I want you to see this. Can you see this? Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Can you see? It's hard to see. But look, I want you to know this is he. This is another artist rendition of that, and I tried to make it as big as I could. But if you go back and you read it later, what we got is the horses have, as it were, the heads of a lion. And what more specifically, what I want you to hear and see is, as their tails, they had serpents that had a head on, and the serpent's head from their tails stung folk. And it also says that out of their mouth proceeds fire. And brimstone and smoke. And if you remember what it said. And it's with these three. The fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. That they kill a third of the inhabitants of the earth. Now, does that sound logical to you? So some people would say that these are that these are writers of a war. Now, like, like I think Sister Took used to say. And God bless her soul. She might be right. The only other alternative to this being another form of a demon spirit is that it's something that John couldn't perceive that it was and that it's like a tank or something. You know, I don't know. Something like that. Some fancy tape, tank blowing fire. Yeah. But again, to me, I'm going to tell you why I don't think it's that. I think it's, I think it's demonic. And I'm going to tell you why. You ready? Here it goes. Right here. Boom. I used to always love this scripture. I never knew why until I got to Revelation and then because it used to stick to me. Look what Jesus said. To the, I think, I'm pretty sure he's talking to the 70s. All right, he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Well, what do you think he's talking about there, right there? He's talking about demonic spirits. Because you remember they came back and they said, Even the demons obey us. Right? And he says, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. See, so right now what the Lord wants you to know and what he wants me to know is that as soldiers in his army he's given you and i power to tread on serpents and scorpions we can't see them right now but i guarantee you that they're trying to wreak havoc in your yes, life sir. Yes, sir. how do they do that by affecting infecting other people around you or by trying to mess with you Come on. the war paul said we don't war against flesh
flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Listen, when people are not submitted to the Lord and the enemy has his way in their life, they do messed up stuff. And guess what? You may very well be affected by them. Yes, sir. Right? Lord, yes, help sir. But the Lord wants you to know he will give you victory. He will. I, can I tell you that God wants to give you victory? He wants so bad to give you victory. He wants to get you through whatever it is that you're going through. He, you know why he wants to get you through? Because he, he will get glory out of it. That, that, but yeah, but I could have gotten through anything with this thing. No, 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 no. He will get you through it, my friend. Amen. He can get you through it. And he will get glory from it. Praise God. Because he'll be like, man, how they went through that? And they still stay in it. By yes. the grace of the Lord. He'll make yes. you strong, man. I'm yes. telling you right now, God, the Lord will make you strong. Amen. Yes. Amen. Oh, I wish I could say we need to quit being sissies in the, in the kingdom. Lord, Jesus. forgive me. But you know what? I mean, we don't, come on. We need to, yes. Lord, help us oh, to be strong. We yes, need, Lord. we need your, listen, I'm not talking about like my daddy used to say. I done told y'all that. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boy. No, 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 daddy. You can't, you can't whoop this one. You can't beat this thing. Amen. By the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. As, and listen, the only way you're going to know it, oh, Lord Jesus, you're so good. The only way you're going to really know it is because whenever you start to get broken. When you start to get broken and you find yourself in the midst of a situation that's bigger than you and you can't get out yes, of it and you can't climb yes, out of it on your own and you get desperate and you cry out on the Lord, hallelujah, he'll give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. He will restore you. He will empower you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So that's what I believe. And look, now we're talking about Apollyon and Abaddon. That's that angel. He was, and you know, what's interesting to me is, is that he's a king over them. And I get it. You know, I do. Because at one time I was watching a documentary and this guy was like, well, why did you kill all those people? And he's like, because the end, you know, he said, Satan, Satan told me to do it because he, because he said, I'm going to rule with him in hell. And, you know, and, you know, you hear all those rock and roll stars, you know, AC, I think it was ACDC. I used to listen to I'm on, a, I'm on a highway to hell and my friends are going to be there too. No stop sign, speed limit. Yeah, I'm on my way. Yeah, you know what? Your friends are going to be there, brother. You think you're going to be shotgun and beers? No. You think you're going to be smoking doobies? No. Sir. You're going to be burning in a devil's hell and you're going to be miserable is what's going to happen. Help us, Lord. Yes. You know? Uh, David Lee Roth. I'm running with the devil. Yeah. He, he, you know, that whole thing too. Like, don't let me get to preaching on the music industry. I'm just saying, they're trying to like glamorize it. If, if this is real, I know it's real, guys. I'm talking to you out there that may not believe me. If this is real, this ain't nothing to be glamorizing. So, you know what? We need to wake up to what they're trying to do. They're trying to suck us into some kind of a lie. Wow. There's a point to all of that. All right. Revelation 9, 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Has anybody ever really looked at this scripture before? I know some of y'all have. And so, listen, a lot of people, and, and I could be wrong on this. I'll be, I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up. Okay, I could be wrong. And if, if you can find a way to prove me wrong, because I tried to prove that I was right. And that's why I'm telling you I could be wrong, because I couldn't absolutely prove that I was right. Many people believe that these four angels are, do y'all even care that much about getting this deep into the word of God? Because I don't know about you, but I care. Okay, and that's why I do. And you may not be there yet, but that's the, that's the preview. You chose to come here tonight, so you get to be part of it, okay? Six angels, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Is it possible God has four angels bound in the great river Euphrates right now? Absolutely, God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> Amen. I've even heard people say on documentaries that they found evidence that there was noises coming from the Euphrates. And all that. <laughs> Dude, I don't know about you, but look, and I could, once again, I ain't got it all figured out, but sometimes my logical brain kicks in and I'm just like, dude, I got a problem with it. This whole thing is spiritual. Like it seems like to me. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. So what if, so look, and, and while we're, and while we're talking about this, I want, I want to talk about angels being bound, and I want to talk to you, and I, and I could be, listen, the more, you know, that's one beautiful thing about really studying the Bible. The more you study it and look closely at it, sometimes you realize that maybe your first belief of it might not have been completely right. And, and now I'm kind of even questioning 
what I've been believing for a long time, but I'm going to share with you what I've always believed. So I always believed that that star that fell from heaven could have even been a good angel. Okay, and he was given the key. Or it could be a bad angel because he's given the key by Jesus. And we've seen that Jesus gave the crown, right, to the Antichrist. And so, but I don't believe that the angel that had the key was Abaddon. I believe Abaddon was in the pit. That's what I believe. Okay, and this is, and I'm using this scripture to describe because it says he was king over them. You remember that last scripture we were talking about? He was king over those demon spirits. All right, he ruled over them. Okay, that was I meant to make that point. Whenever I was talking about those songs, I'm on a highway to hell, and people think that they're going to be partying in hell, and that there won't really be a fallen angel that's going to be a king in hell. But but if he's but the idea is, is that he's bigger than and he's more powerful than. Okay, but look. I do want you to know there's a bunch of angels that are in a place called, in the English, hell, but it's called Tartarus. We've already broken this down. I'm not going back all through it again. But in the, in the book of Jude, which was the Lord's brother, he says, and the angels which kept not their first estate. Now, I got to tell you, what is this talking about? This is talking about angel, fallen angels that cohabited with the daughters of men. Okay, you just got to take my word for it. We'll break it down another time. It's a very interesting lesson, and I've taught it a couple of times. But instead, they left their own habitation, meaning they left heaven. They left their place. They left. God created them as angels, and angels don't reproduce. They left the place that God told them that they were supposed to be. And what they did was somehow they interconnected with women, and they produced Nephilim in the world. Now, some people say, oh, preacher, you need to quit teaching all that. No, no, no. I got, I got, the Lord showed up in a barroom bathroom, and you know what he told me? Preach my word for the way it's written. I got a mandate from God. I ain't listening to no man no more by the grace of the Lord. You don't want to be in the flesh, pray for me that I don't get in the flesh. But I'm going to tell you, no, people that are going to come to this church are going to hear the whole thing. It's not my job to protect people from the word of the Lord. You don't need to be protected from the word of the Lord. If God put it in his word... He wants people to hear it. They may not be ready for it right now, and they might exit stage left. But guess what? They might be back again in two weeks. You never know. All right? So let's just stay faithful to the Lord. Look, angels which kept not their first state. They started to cohabit with the daughters of men. What has he done with them? He's, revert, he's reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgments of the great day. Now. One of the understandings that I always had about this verse, I used to connect it to the one that we read about the angel that unlocked the bottomless pit. And I used to connect it thinking that Apollyon or Abaddon was one of these. Does that make sense when I'm trying to say that Abaddon, the king of the bottomless pit, was reserved in this place, okay, along with other fallen angels, because there's a bunch of them, okay, and that they were going to be released on this day. To, to bring judgment along with these demon spirits upon the people that were still on the earth. Now, if you read the rest of the context, though, I start to wonder if I might have missed it. I'm going to interrupt with you because he goes on to say that just as the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah received judgment, these angels also, because they went after strange flesh. Well, what would that mean? Well, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what they did, right? They went after strange flesh. Meaning they committed acts of homosexuality. They weren't supposed to do that. Okay. These angels went after strange flesh in that they were angels and they went after humans. They cohabited with humans. So anyway, but, but to me, there's still this thought in my mind that there's all these angels that are reserved in darkness. And that this key was used to open the bottomless pit. And that Apollyon and Abaddon, he was in there. That word Apollyon or Abaddon means great destroyer, by the way. And I got to tell you, if you do research, there's many times in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you remember, whenever what did the Lord say on Passover? He said, I'm going to send my, my, my angel of death through the land. And there's other spots where it says, that describes an angel as a destroyer, but it's actually fighting for you. Okay, so the word Abaddon and Apollyon is still, I'm still up in the air. Is it a good angel? Is it a bad angel? Was he in the pit? Was, it, was he not in the pit? There's a part to me that believes that he was one of these angels. He was a bad, bad dude. And, he, and he's not the same as Satan or Hapani Ross, the evil one. But he's in here along with other ones. And that whenever that key opens up the bottomless pit, and all these spirits come out that also some of these angels could be released to wreak havoc on those that are on the earth. So that's, that's my 
that's one of the things that I've always thought. This is Babylon right here, and I'm talking about Euphrates still. Y'all still with me? I'm talking about the great river Euphrates. I'm going to blow it up a little bit, let you see this. So here we go. You see that? Can you see that a little bit better? So that first river, you can't see it probably. That first river, let me see if I can draw a picture. For you. That first river right there, this one, that's by Babylon. You see that? Oh, here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. That first river is the river Euphrates. Now, I want, you, I want to just make a point because I made the comment. Could it be that it's four angels that are literally in the literal river Euphrates? Absolutely. It's possible because God is God. And who am I going to put? How a little man like me going to put God in a box? But in my mind, because this whole thing is so supernatural and I think about the whole of the Bible, this is what my mind wants to believe. That if you look at Babylon, are you familiar with Babylon? Can I tell you that Babylon has been a problem from the get go with God? Can, can I tell you that somewhere probably around here maybe is where the Tower of Babel was? Maybe. But it was in the area of Babylon. And can I tell you that, that, that there's so much imagery of the Tower of Babel and humanity defying God and the nations defying God and worshiping false gods. And part of this chapter in the end when we close tonight is going to say even after all this, guess what they didn't do? They didn't repent. From their sorceries and worshiping devils. And I was trying to make a point to you earlier that they've been having some weird stuff going on on this earth for a long time. And listen, some people may not agree with this, but even when you look at Egyptian uh, paintings on walls, ancient paintings, and you see, you can Google them when you go home, mixtures of different animals, and they're painted on the Egyptian walls. It, like a pan is a man that has a head of a man and the body of a horse. And, and look, so this is maybe come across as crazy, but people have really postulated and wondered what all was going on with them fallen angels and out back with them daughters of men and what all were they doing and what all did they mix together? And, and listen, you can even do some crazy research right now because it's got some weird According to some things, weird stuff going on now. Where they mixing stuff together? And the Lord said in the book of Leviticus, don't mix two different kind of seeds in your field and different things like that. It's like, why are you so worried about people mixing stuff up? Because the seed of the woman will crush your head. And these fallen angels tried to corrupt the seed of the woman. And they're trying to mix seeds. And the Lord's trying to tell us something through all of this. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that them locusts that we looked at, Oh, that could be deep because guess what? Them Nephilim, those those were probably look more like humans, I guess. But get but whatever them angels was making, anytime that one of them things died, that spirit was released because those things were not human. Does that make sense? They weren't angels and they weren't human, and now they're they're like demon spirits, whatever they are. I can't prove all that. But I, can, but I can't, I feel like I can prove that the Nephilim, disembodied Nephilim are demon spirits. Okay. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I believe Babylon is a source of problems against God from the beginning and very spiritual in nature. And as a matter of fact, when you, when we get to Revelation 17 and 18, if you hang out with me long enough, it's going to say that great harlot Babylon. It's not talking about a woman. It's talking about it's talking about the beast system that's been in existence from the beginning and has been moving humanity away from God. And he calls it that great. And he talks about Babylon, that great city in Revelation 18. And he's talking about financial Babylon. And it's going to all come crashing down. And he said, come out of her, my people. It's a spiritual Babylon. Some people have taught that they're going to have to rebuild the city of Babylon. For, I don't believe that. It's, that, that, that. No, there's a spiritual Babylon. Again, I, could, I might be wrong about this particular thing. So what am I trying to say? This river means fruitfulness. That's what Euphrates means. It means fruitfulness. The fruit of Babylon, spiritually speaking, has been trying to destroy the work of God. So is there a Euphrates river down there in the bottomless pit where these four? I, I can't prove that but i'm just trying to say that you know it makes me wonder is there something else uh going on all right so let's see here if we look at the book of revelation as a whole the lamb pronounces war on the harlot 
which is Babylon. The Babylon he is at war with is not a physical Babylon. It is a spiritual Babylon that has been at war with God from the beginning. All right. So we're getting towards the end here. Are y'all ready? We're going to close this now. In a second. And so Revelation 9, 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And the rest of the men, this is the part I want you to see. So again, I, I want you, I want you to, I want to just take just a couple more minutes. You just bear with me. I want you to imagine the world that you live in. And I want you to imagine that God created it in perfection. And I want you to imagine that He formed Adam out of an un like out of a perfect earth. Amen. And Adam had no sin in him. And Adam was given dominion over the earth. And that God's plan was for man to reproduce. And that they were going to live with man, God for all eternity. And then Adam fell. And when he fell, if you read your Bible, you'll remember. God cursed the ground. And he said, thorn and thistle will it bring back to you. You will work by the sweat of your brow. And if you read your Bible in Romans 8, it says all creation groans. And you know what it waits for? You know what it's moaning and groaning over? It's waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. Yes, you've already been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but there's coming another redemption where God's going to make it all right, my friend. He's going to give you a new body, a glorified, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And there's going to be no more ungodliness. And there's going to be no more pain and sorrow, and he will wipe away Every tear from their eye. Uh, but in the meantime, it just got worse. And it just went underground after the flood. You hear me? It went underground and you just can't see it. But they still doing sick stuff. You hear me? There's sick stuff going on out there. And these demonic spirits are all behind it. And they're doing sick stuff. Not everybody that does sick stuff is purposefully worshiping the devil. You understand that? I want you to know that. Some people are just collateral damage. And they've been... They've been enticed by these spirits, right? But, but deep devil worshipers, true devil worshipers, they doing stuff like that on purpose. I know I talk too much. Forgive me. I told, taught y'all about this before. Aleister Crowley read the Bible. He knew the Bible better than most Christians. Why? So that he could find what God hated and create occultic magic as he did the opposite of what God told him. And he taught his people to do it. And they believe that they found great power in that. And what I'm trying to tell you is, that's the kind of stuff that's going on here. All that pedophilia stuff you you saw. And look, it even made it to Fox News, dude. If it made it to Fox News, whenever they were talking about all that ring of pedophilia and that Epstein stuff and all that, you think that's just people that have a proclivity to No, 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 no. That's like, that's what the devil wants. The devil wants destruction and perversion, and he moves towards that, and that's how they call upon him. I'm here to tell you, I believe it, and you might think I'm crazy, but I believe it, and I believe that this does been going on, and I believe that in the end, God is going to get his vengeance, and you know what, devil, listen, listen, God is so good, because you know what the word of God says? This, it says, the spirit of the bride says, come, let him who hears Say come. What does that even mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. The spirit of God loves mankind so much that he's been preaching the gospel since the beginning as soon as the fall fell. And he said, the seed of the woman will crush your head, you lion serpent. And God has been very methodical. He created a nation and through that nation, he gave us Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus said, I will give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. If you will give your heart to me, if you will believe in me, I will fill you up with my spirit. And God's been doing Doing that for the last 2,000 years, and he's taking back this earth one believer at a time. My question is, are you in? Are you in, Christian? 
And if you are, you know what you do? You take it one minute at a time, one step at a time. You learn a little bit more about you, Jesus. You quit trying to feed. Lord, help us all not want to feed our flesh. Because we all got it. Come on. If we're honest with each other, there's still stuff that makes our, Lord. But you got to understand something. That flesh is going to get in the way of you and the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And as we grow in Christ, we're going to want to give glory to God. Look, they, they repented not of their works. Imagine if you got stung by a scorpion and you was in pain for five months. You think you'd repent? No. Nope. They don't repent. That they should not worship devils and idols of gold. Here's the last slide when we close. Neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries. I want you to understand something. And then I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to release you and let you go home. <laughs> This is the last book of the Bible. And it says, they, neither did they repent of their sorceries. This is the Bible. My friend, this is the word of the living God. What is your point? The Bible's telling you that people still practicing black magic at the end of the earth. That's the point that I want to make. I want you to see that. I didn't say that. The word of the Lord said that. And they're going to have people that refuse to repent of. Right there, it's in the Bible. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank that you, that you that we can see your word, that you have a plan, oh Lord God, and you've been moving according to your plan for thousands of years of human history. Lord, I thank you that you've allowed us in this room to be part of that plan. I thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody watching on this video at some point, it'll be the first time that you understood that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that even though you were born fallen in Adam, you can be born again. That God the Father sent his only begotten son to die on a cross, to die for your sin because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You got to call on his name. Call on his name. Believe with your heart and, and call on his name. Call on the name of Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I repent, which means to turn away. I want to turn away from my old life, Lord, and I want to turn to you. Fill me up with your spirit. Change my heart. Change my life. Listen, if that's you, if you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you right now, the Lord's going to change your heart and your life. If you're in this place tonight and you would say, I gave my heart to the Lord, but I still struggle, guess what? Every last one of God's followers, every last one of God's children has struggles. But in the name of Jesus, he will give you power to tread on scorpions and serpents. Father, I pray that you would give us all power. To be filled with your spirit, oh Lord God, that we might walk in victory. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. And thank you for the victory that you won for us when you died in our place. In Jesus' name we pray.